I welcome you to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church, our traditional worship service. I'm Pastor Witt. Hope you've had a great week. It was raining earlier today, cats and dogs, and now the sun's out, some clouds, and it's beautiful. Boy, I love fall. I just, I love the, the changes of smell, the light, the... God made such an incredible world for us. Again, glad you came to worship God. We have a few people that are in the hospital. If you're interested in knowing who they are, contact the church. We don't uh, mention people's names online, except I will say that, because it's mine, uh, I pray for my parents. They both have COVID. They've gotten the antigen uh, treatments and uh, seem to be coming along, but still have quite a ways to, uh, to go to, to be well again. Thank you for your financial support. Thank you for your gifts, your tithes, your offerings, your sacrifices. It enables us to do the ministry of Christ, to, to keep our building going, the lights on, the telephones, the internets, and also to do all the things that we do for so many people. And uh, not just here, but around the world, thanks for your, your help with uh, the food pantries and just the myriad of things that are going on. We also are gonna be doing uh, turkey baskets, uh, Thanksgiving baskets. If you would like to, to make some donations to that, that would be really helpful. Um, we're doing 25 to 30 this year, and we're gonna then, at Christmas time, do another 25 to 30. In past years, we've simply done uh, 30 or 40 during Thanksgiving, but we're gonna do them in two different sessions this year. It's a local, uh, local needy families. So thanks for your help with that. Hope you're ready to worship. We're continuing our series, uh, taking a look at the ways of discipleship and uh, Christian formation of living that life. We talked about prayer. We talked about uh, worship. This past week, um, we had Eric Potter's son, Matt Potter here, Reverend Potter, and he did a wonderful job. And I really appreciate him standing in. Eric was over at his place preaching a, a, a sermon on um, stewardship. And so that was kind of neat. Uh, had a great week down at the beach. This week we're going to talk about study and what it means to individually and corporately study and how that blesses God and blesses us. So as we begin to, to turn toward worship, let us take a couple moments and center ourselves on Christ. Let us pray.
please join me for our call to worship. Put the question to our ancestors. Study what they learned from their ancestors. For we're newcomers at this, with a lot to learn, and not too long to learn it. So why not let the ancients teach you, tell you what's what, instruct you and what they knew from experience? Yes, we should learn from those who pass it on to us. Can mighty pine trees grow tall without soil? Can luscious tomatoes flourish without water? Blossoming flowers look beautiful before they're cut or picked, but they wither more quickly than grass without soil or water. That's what happens to all who forget God. All their hopes come to nothing. They hang their life from one thin thread. They hitch their fate to a spider web. One jiggle and the thread breaks. One jab and the web collapses. Let us seek sustenance by the study of God's way, like the mighty oak does being planted in good soil and by abundant fresh water. Let us grow strong in God's ways. Hear now our centering prayer. Lord God, without an understanding of you and your ways, we are but floundering amidst the chaos of this lost world, seeking but not finding peace or direction. Teach us your ways, O Lord, that we may find satisfaction and hope, love, and joy for this and every day to come. Amen. Let us pray for illumination. Open our minds and hearts, O Lord, to hear your written word. Make it be a word we need to receive to be more like you. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. And our second scripture is from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. Every year, Jesus' parents traveled to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up as they always did for the feast. When it was over and they left for home, the child Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know it. Thinking he was somewhere in the company of pilgrims, they journeyed for a whole day and then began looking for him among relatives and neighbors. When they didn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem looking for him. The next day they found him in the temple seated among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. The teachers were all quite taken with him, impressed with the sharpness of his answers. But his parents were not impressed. They were upset and hurt. His mother said, Young man, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been half out of our minds looking for you. He said, Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I had to be here, dealing with the things of my father? But they had no idea what he was talking about. So he went back to Nazareth with them and lived obediently with them. His mother held these things dearly deep within herself, and Jesus matured growing up in both body and spirit, blessed by both God and people. The written word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. In the last couple weeks, we've been talking about how we can become better disciples. 
We have learned that prayer and worship are important ways to show our love for God, and that praying and worshiping can make us better disciples. This week, we're going to find that learning and studying about God can make us better disciples. You know, most of us like to do new things. We like to try new things. We like to go new places. We like to see new things. We like to hear new stories. Jesus did too. When he was just a boy, he went to the temple with his parents. He was so busy listening and learning about new things about God from the priests that when his parents left to go home he didn't go with them he stayed behind without their permission his parents were not happy with him but fortunately the priest told his parents how very impressed they were with Jesus' ability to, to think and to reason. Well, God has given each of us different ways of learning. Some of us learn by watching, some of us by listening, some of us by doing things. God has given us different interests and different talents. We may have different favorite subjects, things that seem easier to us than others and far more interesting. We can all learn, but we may discover and remember in different ways. God wants us to learn about him and to study his ways. One of the reasons that God sent Jesus to earth was to help us to learn more about him. You see, Jesus was still God, but in a human form. He came to us as a baby, grew to be a boy and a man, and were able then to hear and read about stories about Jesus and from them we can see how Jesus treated others and learn how to care for all people. Studying helps us to become better disciples. Let us pray. God Help us to learn about you by reading and studying the Bible. Especially, could you help us to hear what Jesus said? Amen. Thank you.
as we uh, continue our walk through this series. Um, we've talked about the life of prayer, the life of worship. Today we're going to talk about the life of study. This series that we're working on, The Way of Discipleship, Christian Life Formation Strategies, I think is key for us in becoming better disciples of Jesus Christ and walking into what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I hope you're taking it seriously. Um, I hope you're, uh, you're actually moving through the process of thinking about prayer and trying to be sure that you have corporate and individual prayer. Uh, I want to thank Matt Potter for coming over, Reverend Potter, and uh, sharing this past week about worship. Fantastic job. And I hope you're doing individual and corporate worship. Today, we, as I said, we're going to talk about study. Study. Uh, my belief is that if, if we can get this side of that graph of loving God, if we can get this in tight, that it really begins to help us in loving and serving other people. Let us pray as we begin our worship service. Father, I thank you for your love and grace. I thank you for this week, the beauty of fall. And uh, some of our people need to be lifted, need to be cared for, uh, surround them with folks that love them, and pour back upon them some of the love that they've shared out over the years with other folks. Open us, Lord, as we go through these scriptures and uh, think about you and think about what it means to study, to learn, to open ourselves to new things, to new ways. I am ever more convinced that you have so much more to say to us. And uh, oftentimes our ears get plugged and we just don't hear new things. Help us today to open ourselves to, to thinking about this, maybe in a new way, so that we can become a better disciple of you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, thanks for being in our lives. Father, God, creator, sustainer, thank you. It's in your holy name that we offer this prayer. Amen. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. If you go to your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52, you'll find that particular piece of scripture, Luke 2, 41 to 52, 11 verses there. It's a story about uh, Jesus' parents leaving Jerusalem, um, and after they've been down for the Passover feast, and, and they go about a day's journey, and suddenly they realize that Jesus is not with them. And they search throughout all the folks that have traveled to Jerusalem with them. They can't find him. And so they turn and head back for Jerusalem. My guess is that they're having to search everywhere along the way on their path back. Um, the scriptures say it says that it takes them a couple days. Uh, when they get to Jerusalem, they find Jesus inside the temple. Now, I always remember the, how old Jesus is because of who finds him, and that indicates to me where he is. Uh, in case I can't remember his age, if he's over a certain age, he's inside the court of the men, but because his mother finds him, he's outside of the court of the men, and so that indicates to me a different age. And and she, you know, she has this, uh, this sentence of, uh, you know, why is it that you've treated your father and me this way? And Jesus said, did you not know that I would be in my father's house doing my father's business. You know, this, this thought process of Jesus remaining at the temple and studying uh, has always kind of intrigued me, that, that he would um, that he would say to his parents, did you not know that I would be here in my father's house? There's also a, a comment in there that's made by the, uh, the folks that are around him, and they are amazed at this 12-year-old kid knows the things that he does. I suspect it's probably not the knowledge that impresses them, but rather it's the understanding that came along with the knowledge. He, um, 
he apparently had the ability to put thoughts together that really challenged them. And certainly, you know, as we read about Jesus in his adulthood, uh, when folks come to try and trip him up and such, he seems to have the ability to, to walk through these circumstances um, beautifully. Now, let me say to you that, that sometimes people are just mean-spirited, and it really doesn't matter uh, how good you are at doing what you do. That won't matter at all. And it didn't matter for Jesus either. Uh, there were people that didn't like him, and they simply chewed on him and his ways no matter what. Um, you may have experienced this in your life, that you've had people that, that have chewed on you, and you didn't do anything wrong at all. Um, this is the adversary's way, and I think it's just simply a part, of, a part of how life goes as a Christian. And I would say to you that not giving in to those things, not becoming like them. I don't know about you, but when someone throws something across my bow, the first thing I want to do is swing a gun around in their direction and toss one across their bow. And then I take a deep breath, and I lean back, and I go, well, that's not God's way. Well, what has brought me to that kind of thought process is a lifetime of studying other people and studying Jesus. And so I say to you that study is really, really important. We talked about prayer. We've talked about worship, two vitally important pieces of loving God. I want to remind you that we said weeks ago that uh, Jesus was asked, in, in this very scenario that I'm talking about, where people were coming and trying to trip him up, and so a lawyer came to him, and a lawyer said, you know, hey, what's the greatest commandment? Hoping he'd make a mistake so they could then go, ah, there we go, the marginalization. But Jesus said, uh, yeah, you know, you know the scriptures like I do. Way back when it was said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your spirit and all your mind and all your strength. And in another place in the scripture, it says to love your neighbor as yourself. She said, these are the two greatest, then all other things hang on these two. And the lawyer scratches his head and goes, wow, yeah, <laughs> there it is. And he walks off. Well, as I looked at that some months ago, I said, okay, we have love God and we have love of others. Underneath of love of God, I said, you know, there are a lot of things we could put underneath there, but I think a way that we can love God is to pray individually and corporately, worship individually and corporately, and study individually and corporately. We're going to get to the other side in the next three weeks. But today we're going to talk about study. And I said to myself, really, what does it mean? What does it mean to study? To I say to you that, that I think that everyone should be a continual learner their entire life. Um, I'm aware that there are times during our life when we're better being a sponge than others. I read a report this past week that said that kids, before, before they go to school, is their greatest, greatest ability, they have the greatest ability before they go to school to, to absorb new things, and that what we need to be doing is to allowing them to suck up as much as they possibly can and then obviously when they go to school, continue to pump into, I remember when I was a kid, I think in the second grade, they taught us French. Um, as a kid, I thought, you know, this, we don't speak French in America. But I think what they were doing was trying to set the cogs in place for certain things for us in the future, opening pathways and such. I remember when my son was, uh, was a young boy, he had an eye injury. And they had great concern about getting the vision back in that eye as quickly as possible because the brain has the ability to simply take a redundant system, thinking of an eye as a redundant system, strange, but to take a redundant system that's not bringing in enough information and to shut it down. And even if the eye were fixed in the future, it would have already hardwired that system offline. The truth can be said about scriptures too. I was talking with somebody recently about children going to worship. And um, it, was a, it was a really, really neat conversation with this person. And I remember having a conversation with the, another person one time. And they said, well, I'm just going to allow my kids to figure this out on their own in the future. And I said to them, that's not going to work well. Because 
the longer we wait to be exposed to something, the less of a chance we have of really being beguiled with that particular thing. I mean, there are certain industries that do advertising to children before their ability to legally buy things because they know that if they can get it inside their head when they're younger, it will stick with them for the rest of their life. So I think that we need to continue to learn. We continually need to organize our thoughts to, you ever have a closet that you just put stuff in? I mean, you just shove stuff in there. I've got one. It's just filled with junk, stuff. And really what I need to do is go and empty everything out of that closet, reorganize it, and see if some of those things can be tossed and then put back in in a more orderly fashion. This is one of the things that I think study does for us. It enables us to go through old things that we simply stored, some of which need to be removed, some of which, you know, need to be polished. Let me say to you one other thing about children. Um, when I started playing golf, uh, I went out with some, first time I went, a couple of pastors invited me to go to this really nice golf course with them, and I told them I'd never played golf, but, you know, I wrestled football, you know, I'd done a lot of sports and stuff, and they were like, you'll be fine. Well, I think after the first nine, they realized that it wasn't going to be fine, and uh, on the 10th hole, I hit a ball, it went out about 100 yards, hit a tree and came back and landed about four feet in front of where I hit it. And they looked at me and said, catch up. Really, I think what they wanted to say was, head for the car. My point is, I played golf before I took lessons, and then it made it more difficult for me to learn the game. One of the things that we need to do is we need to be sure that our children are exposed to, and new Christians are exposed to good teachings and good lessons early on so that they can set those things in motion instead of having to go through and relearn and deconstruct. When we go through a closet, oftentimes we're deconstructing things. We're learning. Uh, we've learned a lot of things. We've put a lot of things in, and now we need to throw some of them away. We now know that they don't work well. Uh, our first president was killed because they bled him so much that he couldn't survive the pneumonia that he had. Well, in those days, that's how they thought that you help people. You bled them. Um, we need to continue to expose ourselves to new things. I remember my father-in-law, who passed away a handful of years ago. Um, he became very set in his ways, and his kids, and my wife and his wife, were constantly on him about needing to do new things, needing to be experiencing new things. And, and, and that included food and, and music, you know, just a myriad. of. And he would refuse. You know, he wanted his meals at certain times. He wanted certain foods. And he just refused to really experience anything new at all. And uh, it marginalized him as he got older. And, and he began to atrophy in the way that he thought. You know... I think we need to keep in mind, particularly as we begin to get some white on the top, that the world does not stop. It does not stop growing. It continues to change, and it would behoove us to learn how to do that. Uh, technology. Um, as we get older, uh, certainly things are more difficult to absorb, to assimilate, uh, but we need to continue to try. I would say the same thing's true about the study of God. As we get older, it becomes more difficult to, for us to assimilate, to hear new things. But we need to continue to try. Because the humanity's understanding of God has not stayed the same from beginning to end. In fact, it's changed significantly over the time. Um, I've studied the Bible seriously now for 30 years, 40 years, and... I am still amazed at that document. I hope you are too. I hope you're reading that document daily. I hope you're studying it. Because I am absolutely amazed at that that document was allowed to first off be created because it does not have a homogeneous theology. Anyone who says to me that it does either hasn't read it or is ignoring 
the different theologies that exist that are laid in side by side. Anyone who tells me that there are no discrepancies, that there is no competing narratives inside of the Bible, obviously has not read it or has decided not to pay attention to certain pieces. The fact that those pieces exist does not bother me in the least. In fact, what it does for me is it lends itself to being more credible. I've said before that any time my children, when they were growing up, something went wrong, something got broken, somebody did something wrong, and the two stories were identical word for word, I knew collusion had taken place. It's in the variance in the way that they come at it from different directions that I understand that the truth is contained therein. So, why should we study? What are the advantages to studying? I think that uh, studying enhances our lives. I think it helps us to see things more clearly. I think it enables us to bless God better with our lives. It enables us to create order out of chaos in our own lives and begin to see methods for creating order out of chaos in the life around us. I think it helps us to enjoy life better, to, to have more of a positive impact on the world. I want to say that one again, to have more of a positive impact on the world. A Christian's life is not about the Christian. A Christian's life is about being a part of a larger animal, a larger being, a larger body. And by living inside that, injecting things into it, and quite frankly, allowing that body to inject things outside. You know, Jesus said uh, there, that there's that, that thing uh, in um, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things came into being through Him. Without Him, nothing came into being. It came into being. What came into being was a life, the light. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot overcome it, could not overcome it, will not overcome it. This thought process that, that the way of God is something that has such a resonance with people and such a truth about it that the rest of the world cannot overpower it, cannot overtake it. This is beauty. This is wonderful. This is why I study to be able to find those things, that those truths will exist in the presence of other things, but will over-dominate them. That they will not be allowed. Evil, good, good will overtake evil every single time. It's just the way it is. And even when you're living through what seems like evil times or dark times, what I know is, that God's hope, love, joy, peace, faith, grace, these things, these are not just concepts. These are ways of living. And as we live into them, they overcome the darkness. So the question is, what is study? How do we study? When do we study? I may approach this a little differently than some other folks. I believe that, that study is obviously reading books and studying books. My hope and prayer is that you're reading books on a regular basis. I, I would, If I had my way, I'd read a book a week. It just doesn't work. At the end of a year, I only end up reading anywhere from 5 to 15. I just I don't seem to be able to cut through more. I could, but I'm wasting time at night, you know, watching Blue Bloods or something, wanting just to chill after my brain's been fried and behind a computer and working and stuff all day. But I could consume more books. I would say to you, consume books. Um, listen to lectures. Open yourself. You know, you and I have uh, a thing at our disposal that has never existed in time that we know of before. That of a computer, that of being able to go to lecture. You used to have to pay to get in a car to go and sit in a room and listen to things. Now you can actually do it in your car. You can do it in your bedroom. You can do it in your living room. You can sit even with a handheld computer called a cell phone and you can watch lectures and, and you can watch YouTubes and, and you can do podcasts. I do podcasts uh, about a myriad of subjects. Listen, 
I believe that becoming a good Christian is not only learning about godly things, the Bible and scriptures and theology, but it's also about learning other things too. I think that we need to use the sources that we have to be able to, to learn. God is not just Bible. The Bible is about God. By the way, the Bible is not a historical document. There's an old boy that was a teacher down in Georgia, and I can't remember his name. I tried to remember it for a couple days. Uh, I took a class under him uh, several, several years ago. And he said, listen, if you go to the Bible asking the wrong question, you'll get the wrong answer. And he said, if you go to the Bible asking historical questions, you're going to get the wrong answer every time. It's just going to be wrong. He said, if you go to the Bible and you ask it theological questions, then you're going to get the right answer. Because the Bible is a theological document. It's not a historical document. And that's true. Though you may find some pieces of history, it was never designed to teach you history. It was never designed to teach you that the world was formed in six days. It was never designed. The Jews laugh at us when we get into arguments about this. It was designed to talk about the theology of the order. And by the way, if you say that the Bible says that the that it, it's in six days and the seventh day he rested and you stand on that 100%, then I'll ask you a question. How do you reconcile the difference between the first and the second creation story? The first creation story says that the man and the woman were both created at the same time. The second creation story, which I like far better, Genesis chapter 2, verse 3 through 3 something, that second creation story, Adam, the man, is created first. The animals are created next. And then the woman, Eve, is created. Adam first, Eve last. Versus the first creation story where they're created together. Humanity is created. Now, you can say, well, there, yeah, I don't see much of a difference. If I, can't, if I can't have a conversation with somebody who's willing to see truth, then I simply won't have conversation. I'll thank you for the day and walk along. I see differences. Now, do I see that this is trying to bust down that the Bible doesn't tell us the truth? I didn't say that. What I said is, that the Bible teaches us things and sometimes offers us variant teachings on the very same subject because we're not ready in this moment and as we move forward we are ready or we hear one kind of a teaching from one people and we hear another kind of a teaching from another people and God putting the Bible together was was wise enough to mesh these two things together to bring us to a deeper understanding about who and what God is perfect example of this go and read the story where it's going to rain it's going to rain it's going to rain and the old boy is supposed to build an ark what's his name noah right noah's to build the ark how many animals are called to come on the boat well as a little kid i was taught two by two when I got older, I began to read the Bible and I actually read through and it says two by two, but in another section right beside it, in fact, woven in around it, is a different word for God and a different number of animals. Two by two and God, Lord God, seven by seven of clean, two by two of unclean, woven in together like this. And you say, well, you know, it's two by two. Well, again, if we can't talk about the truth, then I'd rather just say, you know, enjoy your perspective and go on the way. What is more important to me, not that it's two by two and seven by seven, that's, by the way, if it's two by two and we get out of the boat and we sacrifice some animals, we no longer have those animals. If it's seven by seven and we sacrifice some of those animals, then we still have more to continue moving forward. Because we have a story from the northern people, a story from the southern people, and they're meshed together. Even their name of God is different. And their theological perspective is different. Now, what I want to know is why. Why 
that some people come with this and some people come with that. Why in the Genesis story do we have a story of this and a story of that being bumped up side by side? Very clearly, two different stories for two different reasons. I want to know what the theologies of those two people happen to be. By the way, different names for God too. The northern tribes had their way of thinking. The southern tribes had their way of thinking. Uh, the southern tribes continue to exist. The northern tribes disappear. But the beauty of the Bible is that the stories of the northern tribes still exist in the Bible today. That for me is an amazing thing. An amazing thing. So what are we to study? I think we're to read books, to listen to lectures, to do podcasts, to to use online things to now this one's going to be strange for you but it's something that that i love doing i love watching movies and then looking for theologies that are woven through the movies and they're there and then to contemplate why those theologies are listed and why they're woven the way that they are what's the theological understanding of these people that have written this movie that have put it together music has theological understandings. I, I listen to music. I listen to music for the joy of listening to music, but I also want to occasionally listen to the words to hear what it is that that person is trying to say about life. And some of them, it, it's really kind of depressing, their view on life, and others, it's beautiful how they're viewing life. And it doesn't have anything to do with Scripture at all. I think we need to, to study biblical writings. Um, I read the Bible. Uh, I read multiple translations. By the way, phones now offer you multiple translations. You don't have to buy the books anymore. I like paper the best, but uh, you don't have to use paper anymore. Good translations. Read the Bible. Study the Bible. Use commentaries, good commentaries. There are poor commentaries out there, and there are good commentaries. Use good Bible studies. Use good maps. Use good resources. Go to good Sunday school class. I think Sunday school is one of the most underrated things for churches uh, across Methodism. Uh, if I had it my way, everyone who came to church would go to a Sunday school because and I'm not talking about one of the Sunday school classes where they just simply offer their opinion. That's not Sunday school. That's an open discussion class. I'm talking about where someone has prepped, someone has learned, someone is bringing some new possible things to the table. And then to talk about how it is that those things came about, why they are, what they are. And then would it be important to, to put those into the being of us as we walk forward? I think that we need to read books about the Bible to frame our lessons. That is, um, I've got uh, a book called the, the Fifth Gospel, or The Land and Jesus. Uh, these are not books that are really about the Bible, but they are about the land and how it is that, that it can actually be seen as another kind of a gospel that can inform how how things are organized in the Bible and, and how we should read them and how we should understand them. I was talking with Al Laver this past week and he was talking about um, a book that he read that, that talked about location after location after location after location and the ethos of that location and then the biblical writings. That's a great book. That's a great book. Anytime I talk about these different places, Jericho, Bethlehem, Bethany, Jerusalem, I try and tell you the ethos, the understanding of those particular locations. Because in those locations, when you go there, there seems to be a, a, a same kind of a thing that take Jericho. Jericho is the place where walls are torn down. Yes, physical walls, but more than that. Theological law, walls, um, walls that, that would separate peoples. Blind Bartimaeus, Zacchaeus, a tax collector. The walls are torn down and God is seen having relationship with these people and offering them something new. And that begins to tear the walls down with all the disciples that see these kinds of people. 
I think that we need to study alternate things, poetry, art, books on economic and business. Um, I read a great book years ago about the way that the brain works and memory, um, books on history, uh, self-help books. Some of them are less helpful than others, but some of them can help us to simply get at how we think and how we organize information. Science books. I, I think that it would be a good thing for us to to occasionally read some book on science. Uh, it's amazing to me that the scientific things that I was taught as a child are no longer being taught. How many planets are there? Do you know that that's changed? Um, all kinds of things. Certainly in the medical field, things have changed significantly since I was a kid. Um, Study can increase our understanding of God's world. I think that's one of the great things. If I understand that the world belongs to God and God ordered it, then when I study things, not only the Bible but all kinds of other things, I'm still studying God because I'm studying how God created the world. The thought process that, that Christianity and science cannot coexist I vehemently oppose. In fact, I would say that at any point that Christianity cuts across science or science cuts across Christianity, we need to look as closely as we do those two first creation stories and find out why and how and begin to try and figure out what the intersect is and what the problem is. Because there's something wrong somewhere. Because God and science and biblical understandings, and theological God understandings. They must coexist. They cannot be separate. Uh, I don't have time to think about it, but I'll throw one out for you. If there are people on other planets, they were created by God. Think about the implications of that. Study can help us to order our understanding of God's world. It can increase our understanding of God's way. And the alternate ways that are out there. Listening to, to some folks um, and listening to, to how they are filled with chaos can help us to understand what it is that we're up against as Christians. Uh, it's amazing to me that some folks will actually create chaos and think that in some way they're becoming an advantage to the church. That just amazes me. Um, in every instance, God tries to take away chaos or chaos is used to create order in, in another way. And some folks spend their, spend, spend their entire life, hours a week, creating chaos for the church, creating discord inside the church. Uh, telling people not to worship, not to give to the church, to leave the church, to go to other churches. This is, you know, this is the oldest game in the book. Uh, instead of simply building people up, what they do is they tear people down. Chaos is something that we need to study so that we can understand it. We need to listen to a person of God to hear order, hope, love, joy, peace for my great favorite words, grace and faith. We need to learn how to live into grace, faith, hope, love, joy, peace. We need to study so that these great words of God become the, the boilerplate of our existence. I want to close with this. The Bible is filled with lots of things. I was talking with Al Laver and I said to him this past week, uh, he's one of our Sunday school teachers here and administrative board chair. He's also an old sub captain. He uh, he was on many of the subs that we have in, in our arsenal today as the captain of the boat. And I said to him, I said, Al, I said, what's the Bible say about uh, submarines, about cruise missiles, about tomahawks, about uh, what, what's the Bible say about torpedoes? What? What about this new thing that China's coming up with, these hypersonic missiles? What's the Bible say about that? Then I could hear him sort of snicker in the background. Well, I think it does talk about those. 
it may not talk about those particular things, but it talks about the implication of the use of them and the development of them and how we're to live with other people and motivate other people to become people of God. Study. This week, I really would like for you to take some time and to take a look and see if there aren't some ways for you to do individual study. Reading the Bible, studying the Bible online, online webcasts, reading Christian books. Um, read about the United Methodist Sacraments, United Methodist Theologies and History. Read about lay servants, how to become one. And then... That's the individual side. On the corporate side, Sunday school. By the way, if you can't come to church, we have a Sunday school. Al's is put on the uh, on the website every single week. Bible studies um, corporately. Study United Methodist Sacraments. Listen uh, to honestly e evaluate others in the United Methodist way to, to gain better understanding of United Methodist theologies and and guidances and principles. You do this corporately. Uh, one of the things that we don't do in study is we don't study by ourselves all the time because it simply lends itself to our um, not really moving forward in our understanding of things, but simply stating what we believe over and over. And um, that's okay, but it's not great. We need to have other people involved in study. We need to listen to other people. We need to open ourselves to other people. We need to understand that God has been trying over time to get us to move in the direction of understanding God. And that which we understood back here may or may not still resonate with the truth that God wants us to understand. That that does change over time. Um, if you'd like to talk about this, give me a call. We'll sit down and, and talk about some of this. I'll, I'll share with you some places where that's happened. Amen? Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all those who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and before one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We've rebelled against your love. We've not loved our neighbors, and we've not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our sins silently. Hear the good news, the gospel. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us take a moment and pray a blessing on the offerings that we've received from uh, the internet, through the internet, through the mail, through our box, and those that have been dropped off here. Let us pray a blessing on them. Amen. Amen.
Would you join me in singing the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Would you join me in the prayer of dedication? Generous God, we give thanks for all that you have given us. We return from it an offering for the sake of spreading love as the body of Christ. Open us, Lord, to even better ways to steward your creation under our care. Help us to aid you and bring your kingdom to the world. In the name of Christ Jesus, we offer this prayer. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their an ending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. The night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He raised it, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took a cup, a new cup, an additional cup. He raised it. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, O Lord, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, O Lord, and at home and on the gifts that we have of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirits, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church. Honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now let us pray as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, make this be a means of grace for us, a place where we find your presence, the mystery of your presence. Amen. And Lord, may this be more than a cup. May it be a sign and a symbol of your sacrifice and a call for ours. You may receive your elements. Amen. Amen.
world empowered by the Spirit of God and be people of God who are praying, worshiping, and studying, both individually and corporately. May these things help you to live into your baptism and be better disciples of Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, make it so. Amen. Amen.